shows up there. Uh, I am a sideline reporter for ESPN. I do college football, college basketball, college baseball, um, and then a little bit of whatever they kind of need me for. Um, I've done a, really everything. I've covered lacrosse to field hockey. Um, so yeah, that's my story. I'll tell you a little bit about um, my background, how I got to where I am. Um, and if you guys please have any questions for me, don't hesitate to ask. Um, but I actually grew up in Frisco 30 years ago when Frisco uh, High School was the only high school here uh, and it was a bunch of farm town. And then went to Trinity Christian Academy in Addison and I knew I wanted to do something in TV. I didn't know if I wanted to do news or sports. Um, and so I kind of had an internship. My godfather was the main anchor at WFA growing up. So I used to go and shadow him, like an unofficial internship. Um, and then from there I went to the University of Missouri, which um, if you don't know anything about TV, uh, I would say as a uh, graduate that the University of Missouri would be the best place to go for television. That in Syracuse, they have their own TV station uh, an NBC affiliate that you, starting your junior year, you get to work at. Um, I was on the sidelines of Mizzou football games, shooting, doing interviews, starting my freshman year. Um, so I had real, actual time in front of a camera, which is hard to get in the business unless, if you do a regular internship at a TV station, you kind of have to beg the people there, hey, will you let me use the camera? Will you shoot something for me? Um, at Missouri, and you are interested in TV, part of your coursework is anchoring and, and doing packages and stories. So I uh, went to Mizzou, decided that I wanted to do sports because the idea of covering fires every night um, sounded really depressing. So, and I thought I love sports and I enjoy telling human interest stories and you get a lot more chance to do that doing sports than doing news. So went to Mizzou, graduated in 2006, and let me backtrack. My godfather here uh, was a main anchor in a top five market and made a good deal of money. And he would play golf with my dad and be like, hey, you want this tie? I got this for free. And he got 12 weeks of vacation time and got his country club membership paid for. And I was like, this is a sweet gig. And then my junior year of college, they tell me your first job, you'll make $17,000, which is exactly what I made. At the time, I didn't understand like cost of living. Um, so my dad says, there's no way you can live off $17,000. And he was correct. So uh, if you think you're going to get into TV because you, you're going to make a lot of money, um, don't be fooled because you'll make no money for a little bit. Uh, and you'll work holidays. I've worked almost every Christmas, every Thanksgiving. Um, but I love what I do. So um, after school, I got a job in a tiny market of Charlottesville, Virginia, which <coughs> TV market-wise is really small. There's about 200, I guess, 11 TV markets. It's market 183. Um, but for a small market, it's a really great college sports town. Um, I covered, you know, national championship soccer team. Football team wasn't very good. The basketball team was great while I was there. Um, so I did that for a year and a half, and then I got a job in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, being the weekend sports anchor. And that job and the way that I got that job is probably uh, the biggest learning experience I've had. Uh, the way that you get jobs in TV, especially in the local market before you have an agent, is you send, we would send, back in the day, literally VHS tapes. And the news directors who do all the hiring have boxes of VHS tapes and they have to go in and watch all of them. Now you just send a link to your website. But still, like things get, you get like a thousand emails for a job. Sometimes those get lost like in the shuffle. So I wanted that job really bad. I never heard back. Um, and I had an agent at the time which was not a good situation because um, he didn't get me an interview. So. I was like, you know what, I really want the job. I'm just going to drive six hours down and knock on the door, which all the applications say don't call or knock, but ignore that. Uh, so I knocked on the door, and I was like, hi, I'm Chris Button. Uh, I want to apply for your sports job. Because places like in Knoxville, Tennessee, where the University of Tennessee are, 
are very few and far between because people stay in those jobs for forever. So I knocked on the door and he had never heard of me. So he had never gotten my tape, he had never gotten my email. So he's like, okay, let's watch it. He pops in the tape, I was hired on the spot. Um, so don't be afraid like to, to call, you know, especially nowadays, like in, in jobs that people want, though they're gonna be flooded by requests and sometimes doing something to stand out. I used to think if I sent VHS tapes that were green and yellow, that would stand out like in the box. Um, nowadays they get thousands of emails, so it's okay to pick up the phone, you're not annoying. Uh, if you are annoying, then they probably weren't gonna hire you anyways, but if you're really good, they're not gonna care that you were annoying, you're persistent, and in my job, that's a good thing. So I was hired on the spot, uh, did an audition, stayed in Knoxville for six years, um, which is probably a little longer than most people do in that market size. So I jumped from market 183 to, I think they're about 56. Um, but it was a really great college town. I got to, I covered the Olympics in London. Um, I covered Lady Balls National Championships. The football there is incredible. Um, and I just didn't want to leave. Um, and, the, and the other hard part about this job is that I could have moved up markets, but they were gonna pay me the same. So I was like, I could go to Nashville and jump 20 markets and make the exact same money and cover kind of pro hockey and a pro, at the time a bad pro football team, or I, could, I love college sports, um, and so I stayed in Knoxville. And then my contract was coming up and I was actually the weekend sports anchor. So I would report during the week and anchor on the weekends. My sports director left and they offered me a sports director job. Um, and at the time I was also kind of looking elsewhere and I, <coughs> told them to hold off until I waited until I got some um, some interviews back. I went to Boston uh, on an interview and at a local TV station. And then I also went out to interview with Fox Network in LA. Uh, the interview in LA went fine, but then I never heard back for like two months. I was like, okay, I guess they didn't. <coughs> uh, sometimes you just don't get called back. My agent didn't get a call back, so I was like, okay. So then I go to Boston, and I go, and the sports director and the news director love me. And we had a great interview. They put me in a taxi to go to the airport, and the sports director says, in the meantime, you know, study your Boston sports, because we're gonna hire you. And I was like, awesome. I get back home a day later, I get a call from my agent, thinking like, oh, they're gonna give me this offer. I get turned down because the owner of the station doesn't like my look. Um, whatever that means. Um, I, I was obviously devastated at the time because I was like, here's this Fox job I didn't get and I'm now told, I don't, I don't even know what it was about my look. The funny thing is, years down the road, I met and I'm now friends with the person who ended up getting my, that job. She's white, long, blonde hair, and looks exactly like me. So whatever it was, uh, they just didn't want me. But it turns out, two weeks later, I got a call back from the people at Fox to do sideline reporting for the NFL. Uh, and so everything happens for a reason. Uh, so I got that job with Fox. I turned down being a sports director. And, and so I went through a season doing sidelines for the NFL. And then at that point, uh, and what you'll see see as you, in, in this field, as you get into more what we call regional or national networks, a lot of the stuff you do is really on a freelance basis, so you have to figure out how to mix and match things um, for the seasons to kind of make it all work. So like for the NFL, there's only 17 games and then you have, you know, seven months of off season trying to figure out what to do during that time. So with Fox, I ended up doing, um, NFL, college football for a couple years, and then I also worked for Fox covering the San Diego Padres. So we moved out to San Diego, covered um, baseball for really bad baseball for two years. Um, and baseball season is really long, especially if it's a really bad season. Uh, so I did that for two years. My husband uh, came out with me there. Then um, I got pregnant and we were gonna have a baby. And I was plan we planned this all around baseball season so that I would be due during spring training and it was all gonna magically 
work because that's how I thought it was. And then my husband gets his dream job teaching tennis at Pepperdine, and I was like, you know what? You came with me to San Diego. I'll move with you. So plus, like that kind of schedule of 162 baseball games is a lot. Having a family too. So we moved to LA. Um, I had a baby, and at that point, I left Fox to go to ESPN. And that's when I did ESPN. I did a little bit of work also at the Tennis Channel on the side because they were based out of LA. So we were there for uh, in LA for two years. My husband coached um, at Pepperdine, and I traveled all over. And I used to look. Um, this is is only kind of a female thing to worry about, but I was like oh, people like Samantha Ponder make it look really easy to have a baby and just fly everywhere. Um, that's not the case. So my husband would be like in Germany for a tennis match and I have to go to really small college towns and fly my kid all over. And most of the times would make a layover in Dallas where my parents live, drop my kid off through security at DFW and then catch whatever flight to Auburn, Alabama or wherever I was going. And so we did that for a year, and then it became too much, and I told my husband we're leaving. Because uh, <laughs> I can now do my job from anywhere. I just need an airport. So uh, we moved back here where my parents live and my mother-in-law live um, because my husband still travels for work, and I still travel for work. So 10 days out of this next month, my parents will be watching my kid overnight. So uh, that's kind of my job right now. Um, I am basically full-time with ESPN. I do somewhere between 40 and 50 events a year. Uh, it's a lot different than what I was doing with baseball. With baseball, I was doing 162, but I was only covering one team. So there's not as much research that goes into every single game. Uh, what I do now, I have different teams every single week. So the prep that goes in is a lot more. Um, let me, I'll take you through kind of a normal football week for me. We don't find out where we're going until four days before we have to leave. So Sunday, we leave Thursday. Sunday afternoons, we find out what games we have. Uh, and then at that point, you're emailing all of the sports information directors, asking for interviews, setting up things for the week. And then Sunday evening, I'll go back and watch my previous game to kind of critique myself. Starting on Monday, we'll have a production conference call with the producer, director, all of the talent to discuss ideas for the next game. Monday is when I will also go back and watch film of both of the teams from the previous week. Uh, Tuesdays, uh, I build, what we, and if you've ever watched a play-by-play, -play, they're called your boards. Um, they have all the players and notes. Um, so I'll do that Tuesday and Wednesday. I'll talk with players. Wednesday, we do a conference call with the away team. Um, that's usually two hours, and we talk to offensive coordinator, defense coordinator, head coach, players. And then Thursdays, uh, we fly out. Fridays, we meet with the home teams, and we have our production meetings. And then Saturday is game day, um, which is all day, uh, depending on what time your game is. Uh, if you're lucky enough to have a noon game, then you can fly out that day and catch the last flight home. Uh, and then it kind of starts all over again. So football's a lot because because every game matters. So, you know, if it's week 12, I, I need to know for two teams who I've never seen play all season because that becomes the other problem. You're working every Saturday. You don't get to sit at home and watch. So you have to make sure that you go back and know what happened. For my job, I need to know everyone's injuries. That way if someone tears an ACL, I need to know if that's the same ACL he tore two years ago. So it's a lot of reading and a lot of studying. Um, basketball season's easier because you only have eight players that play. Uh, and every game's not as important because there's so many of them. Um, and then baseball season, I do a little bit of college baseball, but mainly kind of towards the tournament time. And then I get July off and it starts all over again in August. Um, but that's a little bit of my story and my daily job. Um, does anyone have any questions? What's a market? What do you mean by like market? Is it like the type of like TV it, and like sports or something? Or no, market size. Uh, it's the size. It's the number of people in that town. So the number one market is New York. Number two is LA. 
Houston's number five, I believe Dallas is number seven. So it's anyone like here, Dallas, Fort Worth, um, and any surrounding counties, anyone that's able to get the NBC, ABC stations um, is like, kind of like a county, but they're bigger than the home TV markets. And then those are all your, that's for local news. Uh, NBC, ABC, your local Fox. What I do now is for network television. Um, and the Fox that I worked at, like here we have Fox Sports Southwest that cover the Rangers. So each Fox entity has deals with different teams. Um, and so Fox, I was with Fox Sports San Diego and we did, they only had the Padres at the time. Who's been the uh, most difficult person to interview? Oof. Um, we can edit this if you want. Oh, no, you're fine, <laughs> because they would know. Um, Coach Calipari is difficult only because um, he, you have a different strategy going in with him than anyone else. Uh, he's going to talk about what he wants to talk about. So if you get, if you corner him into something, he's going to steer it left and he can make you feel like an idiot. So, uh, however, I've never interviewed Greg Popovich, but um, so my stance with him is always leave it kind of general and he'll take it to where he wants to go and then he always like wants to walk off as you're about to ask a second question so then you have to just keep walking with him um, Mike Leach is a different difficult guy to interview um, mainly in game like outside of the game he's fine um, I'll talk about anything you want to talk about that doesn't relate to football um, in game he's very hard to interview um, Bobby Petrino hard to interview. Uh, I covered a Louisville game last year and they were losing to Virginia. And I have to go interview him at halftime, walking off. And so I go up to him and their sports information director is like, this is gonna be a terrible interview, they're losing. Usually we like to interview that winning coach going into halftime, there's probably gonna be a better interview, but at this point, Louisville was ranked five in the country and they're losing to a terrible UVA team. So that was the story. So their sports information director was like, this is gonna be terrible. I'm like, I'm like, what, how terrible could it be? He's not gonna punch me in the face. Like, if he yells and screams, then whatever. I'm, I'm uh, so I go up and he is screaming at the, re at the refs. And so that became my question. Instead of anything that happened in the first half, it was, what did you say to the refs? He went off um, and then walked off. Ended up being a great interview because that's what everyone wanted to know. It wasn't pleasant, um, but it made for great TV. How do you deal with the locker room? There's been so much talk with women in the locker room. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with it? Uh, what I do now, I don't ever have to be in there. Um, with the times that we get are mainly on the phone with them. Um, and for what I do now, I do a post-game interview on the court and then I don't have to do follow-ups. A baseball team is very different. Because um, I was in there every day, before and after, on the plane, in the hotels. Um, when you work with an entity like that, it's very different from anything else. Um, if you covered, the, Mass don't have a sideline report, but like a friend of mine um, is a sideline reporter for the Thunder. They're with that team all year, and they they literally are on the charter flights with them. They're at the hotels. What I do now, I'm not at any hotel with another team. Uh, we're not affiliated with any team, um, but it's different at the Fox or like Astros or with Comcast or they're now NBC Sports. So um, it's hard because. I'll say this, I, I, I've had some me too mo moments. I, I've never discussed it, who it is, I, I won't ever because um, it was nothing to me, like it, it was nothing physical, it's just words and I, I, and I don't know if that's a good thing to say but it wasn't worth it to me because you see these people every single day. Um, what becomes hard is how to gain credibility, how to break news and be close to sources 
without them thinking like, like I don't want players to have my cell phone number. But then how do I become someone who breaks news and builds sources and relationships without that?